So today we talk about the role of asana in Ashtanga Yoga and in yoga in general. And it's a long time since I have given this class, mainly because I'm a little bit shy to give this class. Because I'm really not so very good in asana. And there's also a reason for that. So I have to start with a little bit personal history in terms of asana. That is that when I met my teacher, Harish Johari, I was 20 years old. At that time, I had already been doing some asana and, you know, things. But then I met him and uh, he did not want to teach asana. That was a bit of personal history that he had. He was very good in asana. He did not like us to look when he was doing his morning practice, but sometimes we would take a peek. And we could see, yes, he was very, very good at it. But he never, never wanted to teach it. Because when he came to America, he was living there for about two years, and he was seeing how yoga was being practiced there, then he felt very upset. Because not everywhere, of course, but quite often in America, when people do yoga, it is a very physical thing. It is body work. It is a lot to do with body consciousness. It is a lot to do with the ego. You know, you have many yoga teachers looking very good, having very, like, thin-fitting, stretchy clothes, performing very difficult asanas very beautifully in front of a mirror. And then everybody else also is in front of the mirror and has to try to copy and things like that. And uh, so he felt quite upset about it. And that way he wanted to kind of send a message to his students by saying, I'm not teaching any asana. He did never say that asana was not important, so this is definitely also not what I am saying. But he always said, you want to learn asana, there are so many who can teach you asana, you go there. But then I had a problem. Because for me, he was my teacher. I tried to go to other teachers to learn some asana. But I always felt bad about whatever else they were saying. <laughs> because it seemed like of relatively low quality compared to whatever he was saying. So I didn't feel very good about that. And then one day I started doing Aikido, which is like a martial art, noble art of defense. And uh, I, anyhow, I felt attracted to it. And I found my body work there. Because in Aikido is really not much about strength. It's all about flexibility and about being very relaxed in your body and being very conscious in your body. Those are the main things that you learn in Aikido. So they are in a way quite similar to what you learn in Asana. And uh, especially the warming up before an Aikido class which easily takes half an hour, is very, very similar to asana. Actually, some of the movements and poses done there are <coughs> the same. And some are a little bit different. So, but that is true in many different kinds of asana practices also. But in that way, I never really so much went into asana. But still today, I have a daily asana practice. Because the problem with Aikido is the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to do it. Some people have done it till very old age, but that is by practicing maybe one hour a day or two hours a day. Then you can do that. But I don't have the time for that. <laughs> and with asana you can do that. You can do asana until you die. There's no problem. You just have to adapt whatever you're doing to whatever you are capable of doing. So that is what I'm doing. But that doesn't really mean that I'm very good at it. So that is why I don't teach it. So it's a different reason than 
for Harish Johari. He was very good at it. <laughs> so this is a little bit the background. However, there is one asana that Harish Johari was teaching very much, promoting very much, and which I have learned. And I am not saying I, am, I have mastered it, but to some degree I have learned so that I can teach. So that will be the main asana of today. And the asana that I am talking about is the original asana, the first asana. Because the word asana comes from a verb, aste, which means sitting. It means to sit. Or it means that on which you sit. Also the mat on which you sit is called the asana. Actually this often leads to confusion when Western people, they go to India. I remember one guy in an ashram and uh, he was there the first day. So there was some asana practice planned on the roof. And they told him, you know, you come to the roof for asana class and you bring your own asana with you. And he didn't know that asana also means yoga mat. So he thought, they want me to show some asana of my own, like some personal asana or something he developed specially. So he felt a little shy and he asked me about it, so I explained, we had a good laugh. Anyway, so, but that is the original name. Asana means to sit. And to sit is also what uh, is originally meant for asana in Patanjali Yoga. Hmm? Some time ago we were talking about Yama and Niyama, the first two parts of Ashtanga Yoga. And now we have come to the third, which is asana. And actually Patanjali in his Yoga Sutras, his lecture on yoga, which is like world famous, he has only said three sentences, three sutras about asana. There's a total of 196 sutras in this, let's say, book. And only three are about asana. So it is not so very important there. But it is, of course, very important because it's very vital. It's one of the eight parts of which Ashtanga Yoga is made. Without it, it's very difficult to move forward in Ashtanga Yoga. But he said only a few things. He said, first of all, that this posture, this sitting posture, should be comfortable. That's basically meaning you should be able to sit for a long time without pain. That is your first objective. The second objective is that this posture should be stable. What he means with that is quite simply that you should not have a tendency to fall. You should st sit in your posture and be stable. And that's really why asana is so very important. If you go into deep meditation, then you no longer know that you have a body. You are no longer aware of your legs and your arms and all these things. You are gone. But your body is still there. So, if at that time you are sitting on a chair, it won't work. You will fall off. The moment that you lose body consciousness, you will either fall off or you will realize that you will fall off and you will again take your body consciousness back. Right? So this will completely block you. So many postures in which people normally like just sit on the floor, they are not stable. This is stable. Here I can really lose body consciousness and go like this. Hmm? Deep meditation is not something done like that. It's not possible in deep meditation. There is no body consciousness. Deep meditation, you go like this. But like this, you can stay. It is stable. Hmm? A third thing that he says is that this posture should be relaxed. This basically means that maintaining this posture is not really a matter of muscle. 
Because if it is a matter of muscle, then it cannot be relaxed. The muscles have to be relaxed. So it is not the muscles who keep it. It is the posture which is keeping the posture. And especially on the level of the back, this means that you have to learn to sit on your spine. Because otherwise, you cannot relax your back muscles. And then he also says that the posture should be done meditating on endlessness. This is just a poetic way to say that you have to be able to sit in this posture for a very long time. And he is not really talking about how long. But other old scriptures, they are talking about it. And there, the idea varies from three to six <coughs> hours. So, to master your sitting posture, you should be able to sit at least three hours in this posture. And then he is saying one more thing. It should be unmoving. Unmoving. Like a rock. Like a statue. The statue also is not moving. So that is what you have to imagine yourself to be at that time. So that this movement is not creating any disturbance in your meditation, in your concentration. And then the last thing he is saying is that it should be free from outside influences. Whether there is rain, whether there is wind, whether there is sound, whatever is there, it should also not produce any movement, it should not produce any change. You have to be able to do this like anywhere, anytime, any situation. This is the royal asana. Still today, if you go to traditional yoga schools in India and you want to become yogacharya, meaning like a master of yoga, a teacher of yoga, then they will ask you to sit for at least three hours in front of some people who are watching you and who are looking how stable that posture is. That will always be the final exam. Maybe you can stand on one finger. It does not matter. If you cannot sit still for three hours, you are not a Yogacharya. This is the traditional way of seeing it. So, in that way, asana is really very much embedded within a meditation tradition, within a spiritual tradition. So then when Harish Johari was seeing yoga teachers maybe saying, oh, we are doing yoga, but we are not into spirituality. This is like a very like, good marketing in America, you know, if you are saying something like that. For him, this was like, very disgusting. So that was why his response was, was like that. And of course, for many people, when they think about yoga or, you know, see yoga, what do you see is asana. So it's quite normal to make like this, this mistake to believe that yoga is all about asana. While what I would say actually is that asana is one of the places where yoga starts. It starts in asana and then in breath and, you know, and from there it, it moves further. And it is quite clear, if you look at the many different yoga traditions, we were talking about it last week, if you look at the many yoga traditions, that in many of these traditions, asana really is limited to sitting only. And there's no other asana within that yoga practice. Like you go into bhakti yoga practice, then sitting is the only thing. They will not mind anybody doing asana, but it's not part of the tradition. No? Uh, jhana yoga, karma yoga, is only actually in Ashtanga yoga and all the other traditions that develop from there, that asana is more important. No? And many, many famous saints are there, from whom it was known that they never did any particular asana practice, like for example Vivekananda, which was the first saint to really make a mark in the West and visit Europe and visit America and start with these lectures in the 19th century, it was very well known of him that he did not have an asana practice, quite simple, but he could sit. So 
this is important to understand. And then, of course, we have here in the West a high dominance of what is called Hatha Yoga. Now, Hatha Yoga is very associated with asana, but actually asana is not the main thing of Hatha Yoga. Hatha means solar and lunar. It's good to do with the breath. It's to do with getting the balance in the breath and using then asana to reach that balance. So even there, asana is not first. It is very difficult to find in India any original yoga tradition where you can say that asana is the primary thing and then maybe other things are attached to it. I have never seen any tradition like that in India. Asana is very often there, but as part of the whole, you know, not, not so essential. So, but then why is it so popular here to do asana? This is, of course, first of all, because to do asana feels good. No? That's the first reason why people do it. No? That's the first reason why we do anything. So, nothing wrong. But it is also because it represents an approach towards yoga from ahamkara. I am the body idea from the ego. And that can just be like, you know, yes, associating with the body, feeling worried about the body, about the health of the body and wanting to make the body more healthy. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's still a different approach. No? Up to then, the point where it becomes really something used to show off and learn 908 asanas and not even be satisfied then. No? So this is a little bit more an, an ego game. And you can also say that one of the reasons that asana became so popular here is because it's better business for yoga teachers. And I'm not saying this in a negative way. If you are teaching meditation, there's not much you can do. You know, <laughs> you can gather people, give them a little bit of explanation of where to start, and then everybody shuts their eyes and finished. No more work for the teacher. Huh? But in asana, of course, there's always a lot of work for the teacher, and it's very important to have a teacher if you really want to do asana. Hmm? Because this is another error that is so often made with the mirror. You cannot learn asana in a mirror. This is not possible. Because in a mirror you are only seeing one side of the story. The teacher, he can walk around you and see 360 degrees. So he can really see whether you are in balance or not, whether your posture is straight or not. If you just use the mirror, you will always make a mistake. Hmm? It will be one dimensional only, the view that you have. So when you do asana, you have to learn to feel your posture. You have to feel whether you are straight or not. You can feel that. That's about going into the body. That's about body consciousness. No? I mean, I can say that there's a lot of body consciousness, that there's too much body consciousness, but actually a lot of people have far too little body consciousness. They don't even know how to move properly. No? So there it's about feeling. But so, asana can bring these things, can make you more aware of the body, especially people who think too much, for example. It's very good to go into the body. No? Very good to do sports also, for example. And definitely there also asana. And asana itself can be even the beginning of a meditation practice. Because meditation starts with concentration. Meditation starts with going inside, yes, feeling the body. No? So you can take that quite far. People who are very much into asana, very good. I mean, they will learn a lot from it. They will really learn to be one-pointed, focused. Otherwise, how can you do these difficult postures? No? So that's all very good. But it's also not necessary. Like if you maybe started with yoga at a relatively old age and you feel, oh, all these difficult things, I cannot do it, then don't bother, because there's other ways to get the same results. 
And then there is the whole health issue, which is of course very important. Hmm? I mean, okay, many sadhus, yogis, actually don't care so much about health. That's a different story. But it's definitely a good idea to care about health, because if your body is healthy, then you will feel better. And if you feel better, then it's more easy you know, to relax, <laughs> which is the main thing in yoga. You know, that's, that's all there is, on all the levels. So, to learn to also relax on the level of the body is very important, difficult if you are not so feeling well in the body. So the health aspect is important, I will be talking about it later. But as I said, first of all, I want to a little bit talk about the meditative asana, the asana for sitting. Because for us this is not easy. My teacher said that the worst invention ever made is the chair. Because the chair removed our back muscles, because always we are like this. And Without it, we cannot meditate. As I said, on a chair you cannot really meditate. You can do some concentration practice, you can feel more relaxed after that. Sure, nothing wrong, but that's not meditation. Hmm? So, it's not easy for us. Our legs are not ready for it. We get pain in the knees, in the thighs, and in the back. These are the three main issues. The back, the thighs. So, this was quite a struggle for me also. And what happened is that one day I came back from India feeling very frustrated that I could not sit for a long time, that this was disturbing my meditation, and that this was even disturbing just my sitting with people who were very interesting to listen to. You know. In India, there's not so many chairs. I mean, there's more now. <laughs> they are now also quite, you know, well-advanced people without back muscles, no? or less and less back muscles. So, but in yoga circles, mostly you sit on the floor. So then it's really not nice if after one or two hours you really have to move because you can no longer sit. No? I know also the people who come here every week. Huh? Every week you have this little problem that I'm giving you. Huh? You have to sit here. Huh? And then you see people trying all sorts of funny things, you know, in order to cope with it. But that's what you have to do. So when I came back that day from India, feeling frustrated about my sitting, I removed all the chairs from my house. All of them. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I felt that if I would leave it only one, then I would sometimes feel a little weak and still want to sit on it. And I really wanted to learn this. So I stopped sitting on chairs. And I work at home, which is also not true for most people. So in my office I created some kind of podium because here on the floor it's too cold to sit no? most of the time. So you have to sit on chair height. But a flat surface. No? So in my office, in my living room, everywhere, I made these small podiums. It's not very difficult to make. You just buy some legs and you put a plate on it and you have it. No? So, and then I start. And I can tell you it was very hard. For three to six months it was hell. It was really very hard. But sometimes you have to a little bit suffer and, uh, and be careful that you are not then going into bad posture. Sitting like this is not really a good idea. <laughs> but of course you tend to do that. No? And then in my office, no? here I have my office table, so then I used to go like this. No? work like this on the computer. So I remember even at some time I went to the shop and I bought these big long nails. <laughs> and I put them here on the side. Because always I was finding myself in this position and I knew this was very bad. So I bought these nails and put them there with Velcro 
And so whenever I would go like that, I would feel, oh, no. And that did it, that did it. Then, then yeah, I had no choice, six to eight hours a day, I had to sit like this. And then it actually went quite far. It's not so difficult also. And I was not so young. I think I may have been like 33, 34, something, when I did that. So for those of you who are younger, the younger you start, the easier it is. So and then after a couple of years, okay, I again took in some chairs so my mother at least she could sit properly. <laughs> and, uh, now in the evening maybe also I relax in the chair. No problem because all day I've been sitting like this. Huh? So it's no problem to relax sometimes. But you need to have some period where you make a break. Where you forget about chairs, forget about back support. Yeah. So, And then there is some other tricks I can give you about sitting. But without this, it will not work. Without really spending at least one, two, three hours a day on the floor or some podium, it will not work, I tell you. You have to do that, otherwise... And regarding the back, the first thing is that you should be straight. In this line, from the front, you should be straight. You should not be like this, or like that, or like that, you know, not good. You should be straight. But from this side, you should not be straight. This will never work. You cannot make your back straight like that, because it's not made like that. It has an S shape. No? And actually, the main thing there is to learn that your lower back becomes hollow. If you do that, then you have like a spring. You have something which is resisting, but in a flexible way. And then you can really, yeah, sit. So, that is the main thing if you want to try to sit for a long time without moving, to first of all get that right. And this hollow back, in the beginning, you need some back muscles. And that's the main thing you have to develop. You need to do this. This requires some strength here. No? Until after a while, your spine will more naturally come to that posture. Now you have to a little bit push it if you're not used to that. But after a while, it will come naturally. And then you have one thing to help you to do that, which is like a cushion or some rolled up thing which is not too soft, neither too hard, and which you use to uh, do this to your behind. Eh? So you're, you become more like this. This is essential and it depends. Some people have very big behinds. They don't really need it because they have this kind of support. I don't have a very big behind, so I need something more behind. Hmm? And this helps me to sit straight. Without it, it's also for me very difficult. But with this, it comes more like this and then I am relaxed. So. Then, whenever some pain in the spine develops, there is one very good exercise in which you put your arms like this behind your back, keep nice and straight, take a deep breath, and then exhale up this way and completely turn and back. This is very good for any back pain and you do it three times something, maybe five in every direction. And that is, is very, very helpful. Then it's also important to understand that your head and your neck are part of this spine on which you sit. So also there, this kind of rolling exercises 
They should be done daily. This is a daily exercise to roll your head around. Because then here everything is loose and then you can sit. Otherwise you just get a neck, neck pain. And then part of it is also your shoulders. If your shoulders are too much in front, then your back cannot be straight. So then you have to raise your hands, put them behind you, like flat on the back, open your arms and do like this. And then your shoulders are in the right position. So definitely before starting any sitting practice, these are the three things to do. So that already in advance you already a little bit make everything in good shape. But definitely also it's something to do very regularly. I mean this takes only a minute and then you can do it three times a day. It will be very, very helpful to remove the stress from that area. So. That's with regard to the back. And then when it comes to the knees and the thighs. So then we have this typical, I think quite well-known posture of the butterfly in which you are a little bit flapping your wings like a butterfly. And then you feel here that there is a stress. Don't overdo it. The idea is not to force it, because you can force it in a way that maybe for half a year you will not be able to sit anymore. <laughs> yeah? Well, don't do it. No? But every day, a little flapping, nothing too serious, is good. And you can also do this no? to also put a little bit more stress, and you can, you know, bring it closer and closer. No? So. This is something to work with mostly here on the thighs. And then also important, before you start, if you have like difficulty with the legs, is to properly you know, loosen them up before you start. Just moving them, you know, even a little bit like clapping on them, massaging them. You know, what we've been doing actually in foot massage. We've given a class about foot massage, how to massage your own feet. So that is very, very practical also. And very often when I sit like this and I don't need my hands, I'm going, you know, touching my feet. I'm not just touching my feet. I'm, you know, I know my feet are, you know, requiring some attention because you know, they have. So... But then the main thing about the legs is this. Most people cannot do like this, right? This has to come. And that's actually where you have to get. I'm not having any pain in my legs. Why don't I have any pain in my legs? Because they are not doing anything. They are just lying down. They are having a good time. No? They are completely relaxed. But for most people this does not work because of this. No? This is not permitting it. And so then you are sitting like that. Uh, that's hard. Because that's not a relaxed posture. There you, you are using your muscles. No? So whenever you are doing it like this for a long time, put something underneath. Put some cushion, something no? underneath. So it can also relax. So you don't longer need your muscles. So you can use even sometimes people use bricks or something, like or wood blocks, but whatever cushions, little hard, just here, and then you can relax. It is because you relax that this will open up. As long as you are like this, it cannot open up because you are holding it. No? You are. Uh, making it hard. No? So it is by relaxing in this way that it will go and slowly, slowly it will go down. Yeah. The problem with the legs, they go easily. No? Ah. 
I was just coming to that. It's the best thing. Numb. They go to sleep. Huh? So, actually, if you're doing deep meditation, that's the best thing. Because once they are really going to sleep, once they are gone to sleep, you don't feel them anymore. So there's no more pain or anything. No? Actually, in very deep meditation, the whole body goes to sleep. That is what happens. It all goes to sleep. So you don't have to worry about it. I used to worry about it and think, oh, you know, my legs are not getting enough blood. No? Because actually when they go to sleep, it means blood is less. No? But it's not a problem. They still get blood. You know, just a little less. Okay. But they are not doing anything anyhow. So they don't really need all that much food or oxygen or any other thing. No? The main thing is, if for a long time you are sitting like that and your legs have gone numb, and somebody calls you, don't jump up. <laughs> Because you, you could break a leg. That's the only thing with legs gone numb. You just have to relax them and a little bit, you know, wake them up before you stand on them. Well, to come out of this numbness hurts. Yes. But that's only five minutes. I suppose it's not hurting for half an hour. No, but quite long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it hurts a bit. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, in the whole game, you have to a little bit also forget about the pain. No? This is certainly part of it without overdoing it. No? If you're overdoing it, then you really are hurting your body in a way that will cause damage and then, you know, it's more difficult. So, but anyway, the most difficult part of all are the knees. All the other parts that I've been talking about is a matter of time, patience and doing these things I was talking about. But the knees, that is most difficult and there I can advise one herb which is called Mahayograj Google. So Google sounds like Google but it's written with one U and three G's, so G-U-G-G-L-E, Google. And Mahayograj means royal, big royal yoga, you know. So it is used for asana. It makes the joints more flexible. It's anyhow a fantastic medicine for anybody having joint pains, like many old people have joint pains, so they will be very happy if you give them that. But for asana practice, it's also good. But okay, don't use it to hurt yourself too much. No? But it makes a big difference. It really makes a big difference. Uh, if I know that for some reason I have to sit for a very long time, even I can take it. Because in, I know it just makes it so much more easy. No? But like with anything, also there, don't overdo it. But it is a help. For the rest, it's time. It's really time. Google. G-U-G-G-L-E. Yeah, and you can buy it like in Ayurvedic shops or Ayurvedic websites. Uh, it is available, not so easy, but it is available. So, and then it is about slowly, slowly coming to the ideal pose. And the ideal pose for meditation is the lotus posture. Where one leg is here and the other leg is there. This is ideal. Why? Because it's the only completely stable posture. There, you are having this triangle. You are really the most stable. I'm not saying deep meditation is not possible in any other posture. That is also certainly not true. <coughs> But this is definitely the easiest posture. But for most people, this is not possible to immediately do this and Don't also take it too personal because, in a way, it depends also on your body. The more thin you are, the more easy it is. The more muscled you are, even, yeah, the more difficult it becomes. No? So, but you can learn. So, how you learn it? You start with the tailor posture using the cushion. I'm not saying you have to use the cushions all day. If all day you're sitting on the floor, you don't have to use them. But 
if you are really trying to relax your legs and trying to sit in one posture without too much movement for a long time, then I suggest you use some cushions. So that slowly, slowly, it will come down. And it will come down. It will be a matter of months, but it will come down. This will just slowly, slowly stretch. Don't overdo anything, that's all. And then, once you like get here, no? then you can start with half lotus, like this. So one leg is here, and the other one is in front. No? And there, it is advisable for meditation to always put the right one on the left one. Energetically, this will work better. This will be better for your concentration abilities. But if you are just using it to sit behind your computer, then you can sit like this and then change like this. Anyhow, if you are sitting all day, like I am, on a flat surface, then you're going to have to change. You know, eight hours of lotus posture is very difficult. Huh? But you sit half an hour like this, another half hour like that. And personally, for example, I also sit a lot like this. Not for meditation, but just for sitting. Because here my legs, they are not touching each other. I mean, they're touching a little bit, but they are not putting any weight on each other. Because that also is then what starts hurting. No? If this leg for a long time is lying on this one, then here I'll you know, have some pain. That is the kind of pain you have to a little bit forget about because you can't completely avoid it until your legs go numb. Then the pain is still there, but you don't, you don't feel it. There's no more signal coming. But uh, So you change postures, and slowly, slowly, you, know, you can start doing things. And I've also experienced that to learn this full lotus posture, it is more easy if something is distracting you. If you are immediately trying it, together with meditation, where you are trying to focus on a mantra or something and, you know, not think, then it's going to be very hard. Because then that's going to be the main reason to think. Huh? The pain that you feel and, you know. But if you do this while watching TV, a really good movie, then it's more easy. Because you're in the movie, you forget about it. Huh? Even when I teach, I usually sit in this posture. Very easy for me, because I don't think about it. I'm talking. <laughs> when you're doing nothing, and you're sitting like that, it becomes a little more difficult. But anyhow, that is the objective. That's the objective that, after a while, you really can do it, and you really you know, are comfortable with it. Oh, I forgot one thing. It's actually quite important. If you are trying lotus posture or something like that, maybe after 20 minutes, and become like, oh, I can't do it anymore. Okay. Take it out. Two or three minutes later, again put it. And it will be no problem. And then you can again do 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I forgot, it's important. Mm -hmm. Just relaxing it for a couple of minutes and then putting it back. It helps. Better than to endure the pain. Well, a little enduring pain, no problem. But if you can't hold it, then maybe you feel, oh, I can only do 20 minutes. And you stop. But that's actually not needed. You just take a little time off, and you start again, and then you can move forward. 